Warning, tonight's presentation, although edited for YouTube, contains imagery and subject matter some may find disturbing. While our program is educational, we still feel that viewer discretion is advised. I've been watching anime since about 2005, with my introduction being Yu Yu Hakusho, Roni Kenshin, which I don't know how to feel about anymore, and Full Metal Alchemist. The scene where it's revealed to our main characters that Shao Tucker had unrepentantly turned his dog and four-year-old daughter into a chimera is probably one of the most disturbing scenes in mainstream anime, which I saw when I was seven. Edo, wado, edo, wado. お兄ちゃん。お父さん。痛い。お父さん。君を元に戻してあげられない。ごめんね。ごめんね。遊ぼうよ。遊ぼうよ。<笑> Morbid curiosity is one hell of an emotion, and when that curiosity pertains to horror rooted in another culture, you wind up with some of the most uniquely disturbing experiences. Myths, urban legends, and what's considered to be taboo make for some of the most fascinating rabbit holes. Ever since then, I've set out to find some of the most disturbing and emotionally impactful material that the land of the rising sun has to offer. We're going to do our best to showcase a good variety, since when it comes to anime, not only is there a unholy number of it, but an abundance of graphic, edgy, and try-hard content. Our goal today is to cover a mix of subjects ranging from unsettling adaptations of existing stories to even banned material, and even a few of our favorites. If one of your favorites doesn't make this list, don't worry, this is only a part one. If you comment it down below, I'll put it into a document and put it on my watch later list. Thank you again for the opportunity to watch and more importantly understand horror from yet another lens. Even so, I'm still gonna need to watch Bluey with the patrons after this one, but before we do that... So, a few people had a problem with the last ad, mainly with the fact that I mentioned I had autism. Hate to inform you this, but not only do I still have autism, I think it intensified. And it's because I have autism that I like today's sponsor Raycon so much. Specifically, the noise isolation feature as it helps with overstimulation, which has gotten so bad at times I've even gone catatonic. And for those moments where you need just a little bit more situational awareness, you can hold down the right earbud and swap it over to awareness mode for that extra boost you might need. This combined with a low profile body that fits snugly in the ear even when running down the side of this busy highway makes these a daily driver for me. If you don't believe me, I even contacted one of the happy Raycon customers from the last video. Guys, I lost my Raycons, okay? Oh, oh, guys, give them back, give them back, I'm falling apart, give them back. Raycon is premium audio at the perfect price point with a free return guarantee with every purchase. Are you ready to buy something small with a big impact? Well then, click the link in the description or go to www.buyraycon.com slash that creepy reading to get 15% off your Raycon purchase. 15%! 15%! Not this much. You can choose to buy now or pay later. Now that we've dealt with, uh, that, why don't you sit back, relax, turn down the lights, and prepare to be unsettled as we're about to discover nine of some of the most shockingly disturbing anime ever made. Airing in 1982 and sponsored by the toy company Poppy, Magical Princess Minky Momo was a pioneer of the magical girl genre in anime. The show follows Momo, the princess of the land of dreams in the sky, as she is sent to Earth by the king and queen to become the foster daughter of a childless couple. Earth and the land of dreams are slowly drifting apart and it's up to Momo to stop this by bringing happiness to the people of Earth so that they can regain their hopes and dreams. Though she typically appears as a teenage girl, Momo has the ability to transform into an adult version of herself with an occupation to help solve the problem in each episode. Previewing different 
jobs like policewoman, firefighter, veterinarian, and even professional tennis player for the young women the show was targeted towards. Despite the show's intended demographic, Magical Princess Miki Momo found fans of all ages winning over the hearts of its Japanese audience with upbeat and cutesy antics. Of course, winning hearts will only get you so far when toy sales are your bottom line. Despite being a heavily merchandised show in Japan at the time, the toy company that funded Miki Momo was seemingly displeased with the number of sales and decided to pull out. This would lead to an unexpected form of retaliation from the show's writer, Takeshi Shudo. As in episode 45, Momo's pendant is shattered, causing her to lose all of her magical girl powers. This did not sway the company, as Poppy Toys seemed to be incapable of feeling any guilt or shame at the behest of this beloved children's icon and continued to withhold funding. The next step that the animators would take shocked audiences to such a degree that Mickey Momo would become the subject of urban legend, as viewers attributed the intensely negative energy of the program and its main character to being root of natural disasters in the real world. The treasured children's cartoon character who had become a cultural phenomenon of hope and positivity in just a few short years is ceremoniously killed off by a runaway truck filled with toys. The sound cuts out completely, save for the droning of an emergency siren as toys scatter across the pavement and a plastic ambulance truck tips over futilely on its side. Among the toys is common rider branded merchandise, making sure that audiences knew exactly who to blame for the death of this beloved mascot. Contractually bound to finish the remainder of the episodes, Minky Momo's creators were forced to carry on the show as if nothing had happened. The final episode of Minky Momo would air on May 26, 1983, correlating with one of the most destructive earthquakes in Japanese history. A 7.8 magnitude earthquake in the Sea of Japan which resulted in building collapses, multiple road and road accidents, and a tsunami. When this episode was rebroadcast in 1995, it was on the day of the Great Hanshin Earthquake, Japan's deadliest earthquake since 1923. This had led to rumors that these earthquakes are either the byproduct of negative energy from the people who were traumatized by the magical girl's death, or the work of Miki Momo herself, distraught by the tragic ending of her own show. If you want to learn more about magical princess Miki Momo and her Death Slash Curse, we recommend this video by Kenny Launderdale. If you were to ask someone what they think of when they hear JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, you'd probably get answers ranging from colorful outfits to gravity-defying poses. The still-running manga and subsequent anime adaptation of this fun-loving shonen series have never been afraid to show their love for the absurd and flamboyant. In the book, Manga in Theory and Practice, the author of JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, Hirohiko Araki, outlines a royal road that the mangaka ought to follow in order to create a compelling and uplifting narrative. Araki he is a man who believes that heroes must rise in their stories and strives to create tales where the protagonist stands tall using their own strength to overcome the trials before them. Another answer you might receive when asking what do you think when you hear JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, however, is body horror. JoJo's is peppered with occasional moments where the horror of an enemy's ability is in instantly maiming, disfiguring, or dismembering living things. While the battles of JoJo's are typically pretty tense, the possibility of horror and instant death has more punch because it is a departure from Araki's typical writing style. In no part of the manga is this more present than in Part 5, Golden Wind. Araki has admitted in several interviews that he was going through a dark time in his life between writing Diamond is Unbreakable and Golden Wind, and that he began to write more gridmark stories in order to vent, perhaps even to an unhealthy degree. While Araki would come to regret a lot of the storylines he planned while struggling with depression and ended up reworking his manga, Golden Wind remains the darkest part of JoJo's in both tone and content. The moment in Golden Wind that we find to be the most disturbing is the battle against Chocolata outside the Roman Colosseum. Chocolata is a member of the criminal mob that serves as the antagonist of Part 5 and possesses a stand called Green Day. Stands are supernatural entities bound to a user that reflect the stand and user's fighting spirit. Each stand has unique abilities that reflect on the user's character, and Green Day's ability is particularly gruesome. Not only are those afflicted by Green Day's mold rapidly dissolved if they move to a lower elevation for any reason, but the infection spreads to everyone in a wide area and attacks indiscriminately, unavoidably causing widespread chaos and destruction if it is released. When the boss of the gang Passione dispatches Chocolata, he fully expects a large part of Rome to be completely destroyed. But just what kind of person would have such a downright misanthropic ability? 
Chocolata was a doctor who intentionally misdiagnosed healthy people to get them onto his operating table. From there, he would reduce the patient's anesthesia, causing them to awaken in the middle of surgery, whereupon he would film and document their horrified expressions with the help of his savagely loyal assistant, Seko, as he tortured them. Chocolata's collection of 25 VHS tapes, which he kept at home, contained not only footage of these gruesome killings, but also nine instances from back when he worked at a nursing home where he drove elderly patients in his care to suicide in order to videotape it. Chocolata tortured people not only because it gratified him, but because it gave him a sick sense of superiority, feeling as though he is above it all while seeing somebody else in agony. The wickedness of this character stood out so much in the story and to Araki himself that Chocolata received one of the most epic and cathartic beatdowns in the entire series. This scene is sometimes referred to as the Seven page Muda, though you'll probably be able to see why. Junji Ito is probably one of the most well-known and best horror mangaka, with a vast, prolific catalog of works that are criminally under-marketed to people here in the West. His trademark style is as recognizable as it is unsettling, depicting the horrifying and incomprehensible with extensively detailed full-page illustrations. These chaotic yet intricately crafted panels lie in wait behind the flip of a page, putting the reader on edge as each turn presents the possibility of another of these shocking scenes, presenting a pseudo jump scare in book format. These detailed pages inked in black and white are the stuff of nightmares and help carry some of the less interesting stories and make them really stand out. It's widely believed that it would be impossible to create an anime adaptation of Junji Ito's work without some impressive care to preserve the art style and detailed horror. This belief can be further reinforced based on how long it's taking to create the Adult Swim adaptation of Uzumaki, delays occurring mainly due to the artist having a issue not only replicating the style, but making it animate. While it's still not a perfect facsimile of the experience of reading these manga, Junji Ito's Maniac, Japanese Tales of the Macabre, has arguably been one of the most successful adaptations to date. Netflix's Maniac is not to be confused with the 2018 Junji Ito collection, which, at least to me, remains consistently bland and mediocre across all stories in a way that really wasn't worth my time. This misconception has gotten so bad that some people may unfortunately pass on Maniac altogether due to similarities in some of the shorts. While working on this video, I've encountered at least three people who thought that these two products were the same, which couldn't be further from the truth. Many of the short stories adapted by Maniac either attempt to put a fresh stylistic spin on the story to varying degrees of success, or do their best to faithfully recreate the experience of reading these shorts. The episodes we recommend would be Mold, Toontown, Lairs of Fear, The Thing That Drifted Ashore, and the subject of today's list, The Bully. The Bully is a short story that really hit me hard when I first saw it, and while it's short, it conveys a very uncomfortable narrative. It's about a young girl who torments this lonely boy relentlessly, using the fact that he doesn't have any friends or anyone looking out for him to keep him under her heel. Watching the way she manipulates and even tries to kill this very young child is already hard enough, but as the story goes on, it gets worse. After a short time skip, the bully Bully becomes an adult and is seduced by the man she used to torment. After they get married and have a child, the former victim just stops coming home altogether. The former bully turned mother is now traumatized and is in complete denial, with their son now being caught in the middle of it. As the woman becomes more traumatized, the bully starts to refer to their son as her husband's name, reverting to this childlike state where she proceeds to abuse her own kid in the same manner she used to bully the boy. The short hopelessly ends with a terrified yet naive child walking hand in hand with a newly made monster to a fate that we don't get to see. Shoujo Subaki, or Midori as it was known by English-speaking audiences, is an independent Ero Guro animated movie based on the graphic novel by Suehiro Maruo. 
It tells the tale of a camellia girl named Midori, who is often depicted as a stock protagonist in Japanese paper plays known as Kamishibaya and would go on to become one of the most censored films in Japanese history for its discriminatory language as well as depictions of cruelty and abuse towards animals and children. The film was directed, written, produced, and even animated solely by Hiroshi Harada over the course of five years and at the cost of his life savings. This was mostly due to the fact that the contents of the production made it impossible to gain sponsors. Harada persisted anyway, painstakingly hand drawing over 5,000 sheets of animation by himself in order to create a film that would become banned almost universally and seen by almost no one. In Shoujo Tsubaki, the titular Camellia Girl begins at rock bottom and only descends deeper into misery due to the absurd cruelty of people around her. The film opens with Midori selling flowers on the street to try to make ends meet since her father is gone and her mother has fallen ill. Her mother eventually succumbs to this illness in a gruesome scene where Midori finds her body partially devoured by rats, leaving her with no home or family to depend on. This leads to the girl falling in with a traveling circus sideshow act where the performers regularly abuse and humiliate her, which is the subject of some of the film's more graphic and disconcerting scenes. In one such scene, Midori encounters a litter of puppies that initially brightens her day and grants her some reprieve from the cruelty she endures. When a member of the traveling street circus finds the puppies, however, she brutally stomps them to death on screen before proceeding to cook them into that night's stew in order to laugh at Midori's horror when she realizes what has happened. In another scene, a sadistic and deformed member of the circus touches Midori inappropriately, all while everyone else is asleep. This performer, who is speculated to either suffer from leprosy or be a burn victim due to his bandages and lack of arms, is completely remorseless and takes gratification in tormenting the 12-year-old girl before abusing her on several occasions. Worse than either of these scenes, arguably, is the direction the story takes after introducing Wonder Masamitsu where the plot begins to edge into immensely unsavory territory. Masamitsu is a middle-aged dwarf illusionist who joins the sideshow and happens to be capable of real magic. After taking a liking to Midori, Masamitsu vows to make her his wife despite the fact she is only 12, and begins to use his magic to defend her from the other members of the sideshow. Not only does the magician intervene when the circus performers are abusing her, he also goes as far as to eliminate those he sees as competition for her hand in marriage, including the armless man in the bandages from earlier. To put it somewhat mildly, Despite being an unrepentant creep like the other street circus performers, the film portrays Matsumitsu as a resolute sentinel who genuinely cares about Midori and holds her best interest at heart, and Midori is receptive to his love. The only thing that threatens their relationship is when Midori is offered a starring role in a movie, which stands to be her chance at a better life. When Midori attempts to follow up on this opportunity, Masamitsu traps her selfishly in a glass jar before using his magic to go on a body horror inducing temper tantrum. Screenings of shoujo subaki were exceedingly rare in Japan, not only due to these taboo subject matters, but also due to the fact that Hiroshi Harada will only screen the film if the venue is presented as a carnival freak show. The original 1992 film can contained a couple of short segments intended for live audiences, and was thought to be lost media after the Japanese film censor board cut a majority of the offensive content in 1994. In 2013, the original 16mm negative of the film was rediscovered in a warehouse. For as controversial and outright gross the movie is, there's still something to be said for preserving this work of cultural significance and labor of five years by one very dedicated director.
Perfect Blue is an extremely confusing psychological horror film that begs to be watched more than once. Directed by the late Satoshi Kon, an anime director whose impressive resume includes Paranoia Agent and Tokyo Godfathers, Perfect Blue tackles themes of identity, mental illness, and ironically enough, stan culture. The story follows Mima, a pop idol transitioning from the cute escapist reality of idol stan culture into the upsettingly perverted world of film and modeling, where the barrier to entry for many women is the exploitation of their body. Even more problems arise though when Mima starts to get threatening phone calls and letters from what appears to be a jaded fan. These concerns are dismissed by Mima's management even after a letter bomb blows up in her manager's hand. There is something to be said about the unfettered distress of being in a dangerous situation only for the people around you to gaslight you about something that could quickly turn deadly. A moment in this film which really captures the unique horror of being made to second guess your ability to detect danger is the scene where Mima investigates a webpage called Mima's Room. Having been led to believe that the web homepage was harmless, Mima visits the site in an attempt to put her anxieties around being potentially stalked to rest. Though the site initially appears to be your fun run of the mill fan blog, Mima digs a little deeper and finds a page called Mima's Diary that recounts details and tidbits about her daily life written as though it was from her perspective. This harmless fun quickly takes a turn for the distressing as Mima continues to read, finding that the blog contains staggering detail about her daily life down to her preferred supermarket brands, and even which foot she steps into the bathtub with. The realization hits that the only explanation for this is that someone is watching, and this quiet observer is far too close for comfort. Perfect Blue is a masterfully crafted film that really plays with expectations. As the film goes on, our perception of what is real and what is not is increasingly hard to follow. A scene where Mima is walking down the street clearly unsettled, is then pulled back to be part of a show she's acting in. The entire time I'm asking myself what is and what is not real, all while being shown the mundane disturbing reality of parasocial relationships. I personally love and identify with this movie as it deals with themes of identity and self-doubt. Themes of perception and disassociation are heavy takeaways from this film. And with its heavy coverage on parasocialism, I feel like it's never going to go out of style. Considering now in certain places, if anything, parasocial behaviors will look kindly upon. So I think if you're in for an unnerving educational trip of a movie, Perfect Blue is right up your alley. Taking a moment to address the elephant in the room, Made in Abyss is a series of undeniable quality that suffers from some problematic scenes and story beats which makes it impossible for me to recommend. When it comes to the anime adaptation, the music is some of the best that anime has to offer, with tracks like Crucifixion really selling how fucked up the Abyss can be. So if you take nothing else away from this video, please give the OST a listen. Underneath Made in Abyss's shocking, gory, and controversial scenes, however, is an emotional coming-of-age story about a girl named Rico and her friend Robot Reg venturing in a pit with no way out in order to find Rico's likely dead mother. It's only upon reading that that I realize how dour and dark the simple premise even is. The Abyss seems to be an allegory for growing up, and the deeper you go, the more hellish and hopeless the situation becomes. Due to something called the Curse of the Abyss, once you delve too deep, there's no coming back out on one's own, all but guaranteeing that this alien, inhospitable place will become your tomb. The Abyss is a uncompromisingly dangerous place, and nowhere is this more clear than in episode 10, when Rico is poisoned by a beast of the Abyss, causing her arm to swell up grotesquely with the creature's venom. In the following scene, we'll have to get pretty creative in order to show on YouTube, Reg tries and fails to amputate the arm in a desperate bid to save her life. <laughs>
hearing his crying and wailing as he's failing to do anything about this person's continuous suffering is absolutely gut-wrenching to listen to, especially when you realize that the characters that this is happening to are very young. Luckily, his crying and wailing eventually attracts the attention of Nanachi, who begins to help them. Personally, I think the elevator scene and eventual death of Midi are much more disturbing but would require a lot more context to make understandable. It's just that there's so much with this series that is kind of personally important to me. In March 2017, a lot of things happened. I became an adult, I signed my first lease for an apartment, and Made in Abyss Season 1 released on Amazon Prime Video. On top of that, I also lost 90% of my ad revenue due to the ad apocalypse forcing me to get a regular job as a buffer, so I didn't lose my home right after leaving my parents for the first time. Back when I was producing creepypasta, let's not meet stories, and reddit horror, which I began to hate more and more of each production. I was mostly doing it because I didn't think I could make content as good as the people I looked up to like Tats and blame it on George. My editing was subpar and not really getting any better, and after reading so many stories on the internet, I became disillusioned with the drama filled community, and even with my own channel. I felt like I had finally gained some stability, only to be reminded that I'm not only personally unsatisfied with my work, but YouTube was as well. So. I could quit altogether, or stick with the stories, or as I discovered after experiencing the creativity I made in Abyss, I could take a shot in the dark, risk everything to just make the content I want to make. At first it was slow and people were really hesitant to watch the new stuff, and I still get people saying I should stick to creepypasta, but Made in Abyss made me realize that sometimes growing up, as much as it hurts, to have to leave some things behind or become a different person and say goodbye, it's worth it to begin that new chapter, no matter how scary, dangerous, or uncertain it may seem. That making it to the bottom in its own fucked up beautiful way is well worth it. And I guess without this show, my channel as it exists now wouldn't. And I'm not really sure how I should feel about that. When it comes to discussions about which characters in fiction have had to suffer the most hardship and strife, Guts from Berserk is often the character that ends that discussion. Having been subject to any type of abuse one can think of, physical, mental, and even sexual, Guts can sometimes come off as a character study into the absolute limits of what a human being can endure. Barring death itself, Guts has been subject to nearly every trauma imaginable even before the most frequently adapted chapters of the manga, with most of these adaptations choosing to focus on what fans have dubbed the Golden Age arc. In his Golden Age, Guts develops a pseudo-family relationship with his mercenary company, the Band of the Falcon, finding friendship, camaraderie, and even love within its ranks. Of course, after every golden age comes a steep fall, and this brief period of relative tranquility would be one of the last times Guts ever knows true happiness. The golden age ends with an event called the Eclipse, where Guts and the Band of the Falcon are transported to another dimension to be branded as sacrifices for demonic entities known as the Apostles. This sacrificial ritual is initiated by Guts's former friend and company leader Griffith, who willingly ordains the Band of the Falcon's slaughtering in order to feed the apostles and be reborn as the newly conceived child of darkness. These mercenaries were more than just Guts's friends. Guts had spent his early adulthood opening up to them and gradually healing from his past trauma, only for that family to be hopelessly massacred in front of him while he's powerless to stop it. Whether they try to run or fight, every member of the Band of the Falcon, save for Casca and Guts, is maimed and eaten alive. And all of their efforts to save themselves or others become pointless gestures. As if it weren't enough to know that all the side characters we had come to know and love alongside Guts were all killed, when Griffith is finally reborn into Femto, the former company leader is overcome with sensations from the slaughter of his sacrifices and proceeds to have his way with Casca. Guts is forced to watch once again as the man who sacrificed him and his family takes advantage of the woman he loves. And once again, all of his attempts to intervene are proven pointless. 
relentless. Not even is the sacrifice of Guts' arm vindicated as he's only shoved to the ground again. Powerless as the life he had begun to rebuild came crashing down in the most horrible way imaginable. A person who isn't familiar with Higurashi when they cry may be additionally horrified by how deceiving it may appear. Its bright, vibrant design and its cutesy looking characters doesn't even slightly hint at what is truly within it. Interestingly, this very same concept could also apply to the setting of the story itself. Higurashi When They Cry is centered around a mountain village called Hinamizawa. Similar to the visual novel that the anime is based on, there are various arcs that tell the story from the perspective of each of the central characters. This simultaneously makes the anime an interesting and yet somewhat confusing watch for a first time viewer. The first arc follows Keiichi, who is basically the new guy who just moved into town. Upon first entering the local school, he quickly befriends five girls, three of which are the focus of this entry. Despite Hinamizawa's beautiful and peaceful appearance, Keiichi would soon learn that the village has a dark secret. Additionally, he would then witness his new cheery friends descend into unspeakable madness. The entry in question here is a scene that is commonly considered the most disturbing. Shion, the perpetrator, has her twin sister Neon imprisoned in a cave as she has her friend Satoko bound and chained to a crucifix. Shion intended to kill Satoko as punishment for the disappearance of Satoshi, the latter's older brother and the former's love interest, who left Hinamizawa before Keiichi's arrival. She saw Satoko as a burden on her brother, due to being over-reliant on him. She noted that all she had to do was cry to get whatever she wanted from him. Shion would then proceed to relentlessly and repeatedly stab Satoko with a knife, pausing only briefly to berate her and playfully taunt Neon, whose loud and tormented pleas for Satoko's life went unheard. Even after suffering a great deal of punishment, Satoko actually has a moment where she shows some heart and resiliency. She even admits that she agreed with Shion, that she was too dependent on her brother, and that it possibly pushed him away. Despite the sentiment seemingly resonating with her, Shion continues stabbing Satoko with increased ruthlessness until she eventually dies, all while still being on the cross. When they cry is littered with gruesome deaths. What makes this one disturbing above all the others, if you ask me, are the various factors at play here. Obviously seeing a child bound and tortured is incredibly unnerving, and the tear-filled, desperate pleas from Mion does make the scene rather gripping. Satoko's moment of bravery and defiance was another strong part. Hearing her accept her faults and promising to get stronger and better was quite an encouraging moment one wouldn't expect to occur in a moment like this. This moment is then swiftly shattered as hearing Satoko's final words crying out to her brother is pretty saddening. The scene then culminates with the grisly image of Satoko's bloodied body on the cross. Shion actually expresses and shows some regret for her actions, only to then start laughing maniacally yet again. In spite of how Agretsuko usually presents itself, the show has always left me with an uncanny feeling of dread when topics and subject matter often mirror problems I'm dealing with in my own life. This aspect is so prominent that at times, I'm gonna be honest, it's hard to divorce the two, to the point where my room kinda looks like this. So imagine my surprise when in season 3, Retsuko not only starts a YouTube channel, but also joins an idol group, officially becoming a public figure who happens to be working a desk job despite minor success on the road. Although at this point I had quit the office and was working full time at a gas station hating my life, yet another character in the show happened to be in the same spot as I was. It's genuinely terrifying how real these characters 
at times can feel to me. Not only does season 3 draw more of these uncanny parallels, but it also takes a story into a unexpectedly darker direction. In addition to the usual slice of life awkward humor that I love and the series is known for, this season explores the consequences of being a public figure, and the horror that putting yourself out there, even with the best intentions, will inevitably garner negative, sometimes dangerous attention through no fault of your own. The dangers of these toxic parasocial relationships are best illustrated with episode 9, The End of a Moratorium. After learning about Retzko's moonlighting as an idol, Mr. Tone confronts her at work to ensure that Retzko's performance would not interfere with her actual work. Retsuko explains that she had been forced to join this idol group because of unexpected the debt. Another thing I can unironically relate to right now. To Retzko's and my surprise, Tone Point Blank offers to pay it off entirely in an oddly touching moment. However, Retzko is getting more than just a paycheck from these guys. It's a community. It's fun. It's her actual hobby being used for something not private. This is when we get the first bit of foreshadowing for what's to come. The world ain't letting you off that easily. They're gonna charge you interest on that debt. Pretty soon you're gonna have people coming for a piece of you. Is that the kind of life you wanna live? When the chips are down and you gotta decide. After Retzko affirms that she wants to continue being an idol, a fellow OTM girl, Monica, calls and warns her about an imposter social media account that had been posting pictures of the band along with Retzko entering her apartment from a stalker's perspective. While the OTM girls do report the account and offending material, their manager explains that Retzko's address has been compromised. Because as we know, once something is posted on the internet, it's nearly impossible to fully scrub that information. Monica gives us a golden line in reference to the situation. Cause the losers who don't think we deserve any privacy treat it like some big win. Why else would the creeper who took those pictures post them to begin with? Retsuko attempts to rationalize these serious red flags as something less harmful than it actually is, likely as a coping mechanism. Attending the OTM girls fan meetup as planned. This leads to one of the most uncomfortable moments in the entire series. At this fan meetup, the OTM girls had a promotion. For each person purchase of a CD, you get a ticket worth 3 seconds of hand-holding with one of the girls. The intention is that the more dedicated fans would buy more and have more time to speak with a bandmate of their choice. That's when one unhinged fan bought 100 of these CDs in order to hold hands with Retsuko for 5 minutes. And what does he choose to do with that 5 minutes? So you're Retsuko. Okay. Musically, it's just trash, I mean. Nobody can tell what you're singing, but I can blame you, and I do blame you for being another dumb, no-talent attention whore who thinks that screaming into a mic proves you're metal. You get these simps hooked on the idea of you, and then charge them for a handshake and a smile. You're just a slutty little cock tease who learned a few dance moves. As your biggest fan, that disappoints me greatly. That's half a minute. Four and a half to go. The thing that had always stuck with me is that Retsuko had never met this guy before, yet he had such a deep-seated negative perception about her as a person over something minute as a creative difference in musical taste, and that's exactly how the episode ends. In the next episode, Count to Ten, the situation proves to be as dangerous as initially thought, as it escalates into one of the most violent scenes in the entire series, when Haida just barely stops the same fan from attacking her in the street with a box cutter, in a highly emotional scene which also happens to conclude Haida's emotional arc for the series. The sad reality is, is that when you open yourself up to the public, there's not much you can do about negative attention like this. It just takes one person. It's always been one of those subconscious fears in the back of my mind that one day I'll say something wrong and that's it. I pissed off the wrong person, they came into my house and they've hurt me with the intention of shutting me up forever. Not to mention the social fear of confrontation that comes with people feeling entirely entitled to your time and just don't know how to take no for an answer. It's just another reason why Agretzico resonates with me on such a deep level, and why, at least on some level, I'm gonna feel a hole in my heart when... <laughs> It's over by the time this video comes out. Just gonna get real here for a moment. <laughs> Narrating this has been incredibly difficult. I'm in this transitional period 
in my life and it's just upsetting to think that I won't have any more of this amazing show to look forward to ever again and that this might even be one of the last times I even talk about this. This is a show that's held my hand through some of my darkest moments and has allowed me to bond with so many people. Watching the entirety of season 1 on New Year's of my fellow rebels from high school was a blast. Getting to meet and even be acknowledged by Ben Diskin and Erica Mendez who consistently play my favorite characters. I even made lifelong friends in Jameson Boaz, the metal voice of Retzko, who's even went as far as to help me with the good fight on the channel. I literally would not be the same person today if Agretzko didn't step into my life at the point that it did. Man, I'm, I'm not gonna lie, I started to spiral. So much of the stuff was happening in a short period of time, and my mental was not working. And that's when season 5 dropped. And as stupid as this is gonna sound, it, it really picked me back up. Like, the anxiety shed it away, and it gave me the clarity I really needed to finally put this to bed. Everyone involved should be really fucking proud of what they made here, and I would like them to know that some of my absolute fondest memories, some of the core aspects of my personality, were made with the amazing people I watch this media with. Thanks to the amazing writers, cast, and crew that brought this thing to life before my eyes. I was given the tools that I really needed at the times I really needed them. And because of that, I am literally going to be taking the show with me to my grave. Thanks for watching. Hello, before you click off the video, I just wanted to share a few final thoughts and personal feelings. Number one, I'd like to thank the patrons who have been supporting me, and more importantly, watching Bluey and a few other programs in the Patreon Discord. Anyone who's ever donated any amount of money at any point in time has basically a lifetime pass. Every donation's treated kind of like a tip, and anything you get after that is just me showing continuous gratitude that anyone was willing to give anything. The patrons are not only amazing people who have been supporting the channel, but some of the coolest guys that I've had an opportunity to talk with and get to know. Pretty soon we should be releasing our second album, hopefully once I get a few more songs completed, all of which will be given to anyone who's donated any money at any point in time as just a thank you gift for helping the channel be what it is. I apologize that this video may have gotten a little bit more existential than intended. I wanted to make this video originally about like Made in Abyss and my feelings on that and have that be one of the more existential items, but you know, Agretzico kind of just ended in the middle of production and you know what they say, when you have a song in your heart you have to sing it or else it's gonna start to rot inside there. And you know what, after talking and coming to more terms with it, I am feeling a bit better, but ultimately the loss of Agretzico will be mourned for time to come. I'm currently working on getting some interviews and doing a retrospective of the entire series, but that's going to take some time, especially since I've only gotten a few people to agree to an interview. Reaching out to some of the other bigger individuals is gonna be difficult. This is one of the first videos I've made in years that didn't get completed right at the due date of a sponsorship. So, for the first time, I'm actually feeling a little well rested while filming this and uploading. I hope you guys enjoyed the video. I certainly was panicking and struggling to make it. The next project's going to be four dangerously stupid YouTubers, because like I said before, when you got a song in your heart, you gotta sing it. And I think it's time to reignite that punk spirit and actually go after some very dangerous individuals on this platform. Wish me luck, and I'll see you guys next time. I've been your host, that Creepy Reading, and I'm signing off.